Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Herzlich willkommen im Körperforum. Mein Name ist Thomas Paulsen. Ich bin Mitglied hier im Vorstand der Körperstiftung. Töten im Namen des Staates. Das ist der Titel des heutigen Abends unserer Veranstaltung. Es geht aber nicht um James Bond, nicht um den MI6 und nicht um Großbritannien, sondern es geht um Israel. Wir werden uns beschäftigen mit den gezielten Tötungsaktionen des Staates Israels, des Mossad. Seit seiner Gründung, also vor 70 Jahren, hat Israel mehr als, 200, äh, mehr als 2000 solcher Aktionen durchgeführt. Wir werden sprechen über die Frage, wie wirksam ist eigentlich so ein Programm gezielter Tötung, das von einem Geheimdienst durchgeführt wird. Der Mossad gilt ja als einer der professionellsten und besten Geheimdienste auf der Welt. Aber natürlich kann man eine ganze Menge Fragen stellen, wie wirksam am Ende so ein Programm eigentlich sein kann. Und es ist auch natürlich nicht so, dass der Mossad unfehlbar ist, sondern da ist auch einiges immer wieder schiefgegangen. Auch darüber werden wir heute Abend etwas hören können. Wir wollen aber auch sprechen über das moralische Dilemma oder die moralischen Dilemmata, muss man fast schon sagen, die mit so einem Programm natürlich verbunden sind. Also äh, wenn man äh, Terroristen versucht gezielt zu töten und dabei unschuldige Menschen umkommen, wenn man also versucht, um jeden Preis Sicherheit für den eigenen Staat herzustellen, wie hoch darf eigentlich der Preis sein? Und gibt es eigentlich so einen Punkt, an dem... Wenn man sagt, wir müssen um jeden Preis unsere Demokratie verteidigen gegen die Feinde der Demokratie in unserer Nachbarschaft, an dem am Ende auch die Werte der Demokratie genau durch so ein Programm am Ende unterminiert werden. Auch das werden wir heute Abend diskutieren können. Interessant ist auch, wenn Sie das Buch, über das wir heute Abend sprechen werden, lesen, dass doch eine ganze Reihe von den wichtigsten Politikern Israels eben eine Karriere gemacht haben im Geheimdienst und im Militär und auch ganz direkt an solchen Programmen mehr oder weniger direkt beteiligt waren. Was heißt das eigentlich für die politische Kultur am Ende in einem solchen Land? Und ist es nicht vielleicht auch so, dass wenn solche Aktionen, wenn so ein Programm durchaus für sich genommen Erfolge zeitigt, wenn man also taktische Erfolge erzielt, heißt es vielleicht, dass man am Ende die ganze Sphäre der Diplomatie und der Verhandlungen als Staat vernachlässigt, weil man ja solche effektiven Geheimdienstprogramme hat. Also auch darüber werden wir heute Abend diskutieren. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir einen Gast heute bei uns haben, der sich wie kein anderer mit dem Mossad, mit israelischen Geheimdiensten auskennt. Es ist mir eine große Freude und Ehre, dass Ronen Bergmann heute bei uns ist. Er ist Journalist aus Israel, arbeitet für die größte Tages-, eine der größten Tageszeitungen Jediot, äh, Jediot Aronot, das habe ich hingekriegt. <lacht> er schreibt aber nicht nur für diese Zeitung, sondern auch für die New York Times, für den Spiegel. Er hat eine ganze Reihe sehr prestigeträchtiger journalistischer Preise gewonnen für seine Arbeit. Ähm, und er hat in seinem kürzlich erschienenen Buch bei der DVA und als Spiegelbuch erschienen mit dem Titel Der Schattenkrieg, Israel und die geheimen Tötungskommandos des Mossad. 1000 Interviews geführt, also mit 1000 Menschen gesprochen, die in irgendeiner Art und Weise an diesem Programm beteiligt waren oder in diesem Umfeld gearbeitet haben. Er kennt die Chefs des Mossad persönlich und er gibt Einblicke in dem Buch in die Hintergründe dieses Programms der gezielten Tötungen des Mossad. Ronen, herzlich willkommen im Körperforum, herzlich willkommen in Hamburg. Ich freue mich, dass wir auch einen zweiten Gast hier auf dem Podium haben, der sich ebenso gut auskennt mit der Welt der Geheimdienste, August Hanning. August Hanning war äh, Präsident des Bundesnachrichtendienstes von 1998 bis 2005. Vor seiner Zeit als BND-Präsident war er im Bundeskanzleramt für die Geheimdienste zuständig und von 2005 bis 2009 war er Staatssekretär im Innenministerium. Er ist also mit allen Fragen der äußeren wie der inneren Sicherheit bestens vertraut. Herr Hanning, schön, dass Sie heute Abend bei uns sind. Wir führen diese Veranstaltung in Zusammenarbeit mit dem Spiegel durch. Heute Abend bei uns ist Marcel Rosenbach. Er ist äh, Geheimdienstexperte beim Spiegel. 
ähm, und er ist Co-Autor der beiden Spiegel-Bestseller Staatsfeind Wikileaks und der NSA-Komplex. Er wird heute Abend die Diskussion moderieren. Herzlich willkommen. Auf dem Panel heute Abend werden wir Englisch diskutieren. Das heißt, wenn Sie den deutschen Ton hören wollen, dann müssten Sie sich mit irgendeinem Gerät, äh, einem Knopf im Ohr versorgen. Ähm, Ronen Bergmann wird nach der Veranstaltung auch gerne Bücher signieren. Sie können die, äh, ein Buch, ein Exemplar vorne auch käuflich erwerben und er ist gerne bereit, dann zu signieren. Ich wünsche Ihnen allen einen spannenden Abend. Das ist ein äh, spannendes Thema, was wir nicht jeden Tag hier in Deutschland haben und freue mich auf die Diskussion. Dankeschön. Yeah, a very good evening from us here on the panel as well. Um, it has been said we have uh, uh, decided to have this discussion in English. I hope everybody either understands or uh, has uh, the little machine now running um, for the translation. Uh, what we plan to do is having a hopefully uh, lively discussion here on stage for about an hour and then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and um, Perhaps, uh, uh, Mr. Bergman, uh, the first question uh, from me. Um, you decided to spend a long time researching this book and a rather dark topic as a journalist. Um, why did you decide to spend so much time, research and effort um, investigating this special operations uh, called targeted killings? Um. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank Spiegel and uh, the Kerber Foundation for arranging this. Uh, you know, the fact that people come to hear about these topics and come to hear about books is just amazing and great. And uh, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the book has been received uh, very warmly here in Germany, but also in the United States. And I, I discovered something. I have a scoop about the American public that you can actually have a book that does not mention even single time the T word, Trump, and still <laughs> get some interest. So this book has no Me Too, no sexual harassment, no Trump, uh, but it does focus, as, as you said, uh, on um, the history of Israeli intelligence and the history of the use of this extreme and controversial um, methods Uh, targeted killing and assassination. Why did I do it? I have been covering Israeli intelligence for a long time. And because of several reasons. First, I think it's very, very interesting. You know, I can, everywhere I go, everywhere in the world, I can speak, you know, we can speak about the peace process and about uh, Daesh, we can speak about all sorts of things happening in the Middle East. But once I start to speak about the Mossad, I see people's eyes blink. Everyone wants to know James Bond, the real stuff, how it happens in reality. The second, uh, but not less important, is of course to get the facts right. Uh, this is not the first book written on the Mossad, but this is, I think, the first one that have people speaking on the record with their names, talking about things that they have done from Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, to the chiefs of the Mossad, the Shin Bet, Israeli Domestic Secret Service, um, the, the military intelligence, defense establishment, from very high rank people, officials, to the operatives, to the assassins. Yeah. And they speak, and this is, and what they talk is corroborated by many, many documents. So, so to get the facts right, how things actually happen, and why is it important to get the facts right, yeah. besides of, you know, being accurate, is this is because there is no one single decision in the history of Israel that has been taken, or one single event that had happened without the profound involvement of Israeli intelligence and defense establishment. For good, for bad, they decided right, they decided wrong, whatever. But they were deeply involved in this. And, and therefore, if you really want to understand the history of Israel, the history 
of the Jewish people, the history of the region, and in many, many cases, the history of the world as much as it dealt with the Middle East, you cannot have a correct reading of history without understanding the history of Israeli intelligence, which secretly but profoundly affected the history of, of, of everybody. Mm. And so this was the main mot motivation. And also, you know, because nobody did this before and it was hard. Mr. Hunning, you have read the book, I understand. Um, and as a former head of uh, BND, it would be interesting to know uh, with what uh, emotions and feelings you read the book, because Mr. Werkman uh, uh, told about his uh, uh, reporting the book, investigating uh, the topic. Uh, uh, doing so, he spoke to hundreds of people, among them several former heads of Mossad. Um, and as a journalist who has uh, uh, dealt with this topic, uh, national security reporting, and with you as a head of BND, I know how hard it is to get you guys to talk. <laughs> so uh, it would be interesting to hear from you how you see such an effort and uh, what do you think about the book? I think it is, of course, very interesting to uh, look into the details. I hope they are right. I don't know. I don't want to judge it. <laughs> uh, the situation in Israel, of course, was a very special one. And uh, I was involved uh, when I was in the Chancellery in the middle of the 90s and afterwards when I was head of the BND. I have brokered agreements between Hezbollah and Israel, and Mossad has played always a major role. But, of course, I have been in contact with uh, major players uh, in this book. Uh, I know very well Hassan Nasrallah, for example, his way of thinking, how he sees the world. Uh, I have met the heads of the Mossad, beginning with chapter Shavit, uh, afterwards, uh, Uh, Daniel Tom, uh, Ephraim Halevi, and me, Dave Lagan, uh, in the end of my uh, duties. And uh, yes, I know that is a very, very special and very difficult uh, situation. Uh, I remember when I was for the first time in Lebanon that we have always been very cautious because Nasrallah feared always uh, attacks from the Israeli side. And there have been curtains and so, and sometimes I have been forced to run very fast uh, because there could be snipers in the background. I remember this very well. And I know, of course, uh, this book is dealing mainly with these attacks from the Israeli side, but there have been a lot of attacks from the Hezbollah side, of the other side as well, a lot of victims in this war. And uh, again, it is very difficult for us, for Germany, to judge this under moral perspectives and so on. I think Israel sees itself in a very special situation. Mm. Uh, there are very different worlds. If you are uh, in Lebanon, if you are discussing with uh, Hezbollah, you see a very different picture, different world. They have quite different feelings. Uh, and uh, you have mentioned that uh, the military apparatus and the intelligence services have always been involved in the main decisions. Yes. Uh, it's right, but in the end of the day, of course, the decisions have been made by the politicians, by the governments, and I think by uh, the prime minister himself. Uh, that was always the case in Israel. There was no, let me say, apparatus without political control and political leadership. May I just add, because Mr. Hanek just mentioned the, the name of Hassan Nasrallah, and Nasrallah has been a, a very capable leader for Hezbollah. Now, he got appointed to his job on the 18th of February, 1992. Mm -hmm. And he didn't expect that to happen because two days earlier, on the 16th, Israel has assassinated his boss, Sheikh Musawi, in the first ever assassination that uh, was done with the help of drones. Now we know, of course, the United States and Israel and many others are using drones extensively, but that was a revolutionary assignment, how to use drones in order to perform an assassination, and Israel decided to take out the Secretary General. Now, militarily and operationally and from the intelligence point of view, this was done perfectly. They traced him down, they had the drones, they killed him, but they didn't calculate properly the outcome and where he was 
uh, some sort of a mediocre leader, he was inherited, succeeded by Nasrallah, who was only 32 years old. Never, ever, and nobody thought he's going to be the next leader. And he made Hezbollah into a much worse enemy hmm. than Musawi ever could. And just last week, a senior officer of a general of the IDF said in a briefing with um, some journalists that in the next war with Hezbollah, this war is going to start with the assassination of Nasrallah. We are going to kill him as, 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 a, first, as a first step, just to make, to make sure, to make a threat, but also it gives an, ex, an example of how profound are the targeted killing as a part of the Israeli defense doctrine. So basically we are really nowadays, and he has formally been announced a target now, but perhaps take us back in the beginnings, take us back uh, in the foundation years, because interestingly enough, in the Hebrew name of Mossad, it doesn't only have the intelligence part, like uh, BND and MI6 are intelligence services, but I think the Hebrew name has special operations in it right from the beginning. So why was that so right from the beginning? And perhaps very briefly, uh, the, the book is really not only a history uh, of the Mossad, but it's a history of several Israeli intelligence agencies. And basically, in a way, you can read it as a, a, a history of Israel. Yeah. Um, but take us back in the beginning, in the, in the founding days, and the reasons why these special operations played such an important role right from the beginning. When Israel was established, in, the, uh, in May 1948, it immediately got involved into what was later turned as the, the War of Independence because seven different Arab countries, uh, armies invaded Israel in order to destroy it. And the, the Israelis, or the Jews from Palestine, now called the Israelis, the new Israelis, fought back and prevailed. Unlike the CIA assessment that they are going to be wiped out, Ben-Gurion thought that they will be able to prevail and win, though the count of forces was completely not in favor for the, for the Israelis. But even though it was embroiled in serious war, just a month after Israel was established, Ben-Gurion called to his office, by the way, an office that was built in old time by the Templars who came from Germany and left during the, the Second World War. He called to the chiefs of his military, <laughs> new military, and said, we want to establish an intelligence community. And why is that? Because he realized that in order to, that this is not going to be the last war, and he will need a sufficient alert of the next war. And that in order to, to win the next war, he would need to have sufficient intelligence of what exactly the Arab adversary is planning, what are their capabilities. But beyond that, he wanted to have not just an intelligence community that collect intelligence, which is most of what is done by the um, Western intelligence agencies, like the BND or the MI6, but he wanted to give them operational capabilities. So not just collection of intelligence, but also the ability to work way beyond enemy lines, pinpoint operation, destroy facilities, in later times, planting uh, computer viruses, killing individuals. And in that way, he thought it would be possible to delay, if not prevent, the next war. So do whatever you can and use these special operations in order to not go to all-out war. There are three main entities of Israeli intelligence. The Shin Bet, the domestic secret service who works inside. This is some, to, some sort of a combination between MI5 and FBI. There is the military intelligence, which works on intelligence, military intelligence issues inside of Israel and outside, called Amman. And there is the Mossad. The Mossad is just the Hebrew word for the institution. It's not an acronym, it's a word. But the full name is Hamosad Lemodin Vitafkidim Yochadim, which means the Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations. So in its name, as you correctly said, you have intelligence collection, but also special operations. And now when you have, at the, in the same organization, you grow this, both capabilities, then you end up with something very efficient that collects intelligence with the mindset, not just of 
I need to know something, but I need to know something because I want to do something with that information. And that is a, a very total realm and mindset of modus operandi. Oh. Mr. Hanning, uh, when you met uh, your Israeli counterparts uh, in your time in office, uh, were those special operations a topic in your conversations? Not really, no. Uh, BND has never supported this kind of uh, operations. It would have been against our legal framework here in Germany. And uh, I've read this book and I have not seen that uh, one incident happened in Germany in spite of this Munich uh, mm -hmm. problems, that are special problems we can discuss uh, later on. But uh, no, we had, of course, a lot of discussions on behalf of terrorism and uh, the whole situation in the Middle East, especially before the Iraq war. It was, I had a lot of discussions with me, Dagan at that time and, and others. And uh, of course, we had had a change of information especially, of course, for political questions, uh, military questions in the region, and uh, terrorism. Terrorism has always played a very major role in our discussions. Mm. You just mentioned Munich. There are two big stories in your book uh, dealing with Munich. Uh, uh, one of the stories, actually, uh, uh, you have been uh, investigating. You found out something newsworthy after more than 50 years because uh, there was a businessman in Munich um, called Heinz Krug, And uh, you just visited the children um, of Heinz Krug several weeks ago. He was declared a lost person. Uh, there was an open file with the prosecutor in, in Munich still. Uh, so what could you tell the children of Mr. Krug what happened to their father? Yeah, it's always a challenge when you cross that line or that um, prism of coverage and you, just, you do not just report but you also getting in a way involved in the actual happening when you come to people and you tell them something that they didn't know about their lives. And in July of 1962 Mossad was caught um, unprepared to discover that Egypt, Nasser Uh, but president of, of Egypt, is developing surface-to-surface long-range ballistic missiles with which he said, I am going to destroy the Zionist entity. The Egyptian at that time didn't say Israel, they say the Zionist entity or the Zionist uh, opponent. And then the Israelis discovered it's not just that he has missiles which he just paraded in Cairo and tested, but these missiles are being built by German scientists and technicians who used to work in Pinamunda, the Baltic Sea, where the Wehrmacht were developing the V1 and V2 that later hit Antwerpen in, in, in London. And so just imagine from the Israeli psyche, how is it to discover that scientists who used to work for Hitler are now working for someone who was nicknamed the new Hitler developing weapons of mass destruction with which Nasser is promising to destroy Israel. Now this was, bear in mind, this was 1962. Israel was flooded with Holocaust survivors before Israel has nu had nuclear weapon, before the Six Day War that gave Israel some sort of confidence. Total hysteria. And everything is put on the shoulders of the Mossad. You did not prevent it. So the first thing the Mossad did was to try and hit the the Achilles heel of the project, and kill the German scientists. And just in November, so three months afterwards, uh, Heinz Krug, who was managing the logistics of the project from Munich, um, got a phone call from an, an Egyptian officer, say, our general, the head of the project, wants to see you in a, a house in the outskirts of Munich. That didn't seem... Um, you know, suspicion, because he was working with the Egyptian. And the guy, the Egyptian officer, came to pick him up from his office, and he was never seen again. And only now we can tell what happened to him. And he was, the Egyptian officer, the alleged Egyptian officer was a Mossad operative, pretending to be Egyptian. He was of an, of an Iraqi origin, so it was easy to him, for him to pretend to be 
Egyptian, and he was, Krug was taken to a Mossad safe house and then sedated and was smuggled to Israel through uh, Marseille, interrogated, and later killed. Who gave the orders for the killing? The Mossad chief at that time, without the approval of David Ben-Goyon, the, the Israeli prime minister. And now, this is a, not an easy, easy moment. Um, I'm sure you have seen, you have came, you come to see, you went to see the, the, the son and daughter of Krug, and you were the first one who told them what actually happened to their father. Uh, with the story that you ran in Spiegel, and I came a few weeks afterwards, and I met them, and you know, this is, this is very difficult, because on one hand, on the political and operational and intelligence level, you can, you know, you can see the different views, and you can understand that from the point of view of Mossad, this was a viable threat, <coughs> an existential threat to Israel, and they, they, they thought that they are doing the right thing to prevent it. Maybe I'll tell a story of how they, were they able to prevent it at the end. But at the end of the day, whatever they did, right or wrong, that had horrific consequences on the son of the daughter. And you, you meet them, and you can just feel pity and sorry. And by the way, these are the, the second in the book, the second son, which whom I came to talk, and I told them what was the fate of the father. There's another story of an Israeli um, um, officer who went to, to sell some secrets to the Egyptian, and he was also abducted, killed, and, and his body dropped to the, from an airplane, and I came to his son after 50 years, and, and I told him what happened to his father. Uh, that's, a, that's not, I, I would, of, of all choosing of what I do as a journalist, that's the last thing I would really like to do. Hmm. Um, and by the way, Israel was able, Mossad was able to solve the problem of the, the, the German scientist in, in during one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard, and doing it very briefly, I would say that killing the scientists didn't help. NASA was offering them too much money, and the others just continued to work. And in any case, most of the operation failed. And the Mossad thought, and this became a, a big political uh, thing in Israel, the head of the Mossad had to, be, to step down, and the Israeli prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, resigned because of that, because he was attacked, that he, while he's managing the reconciliation with Germany. Germany is turning a blind eye to the fact that German scientists are helping Israel adversary. At the end of the day, what solved the problem was that Mossad needed to have someone inside the project. And a German-born Mossad case officer, the head of the Mossad office in Bonn, someone called Avraham Achituv, who was born in Frankfurt, and, all, and lost all, all of his family in the Holocaust, he came to the Mossad chief and said, listen, I think that if we recruit Otto Skorzeny to be our major spy, we will be able to, to get enough information and, and cripple the project from in the inside. Otto Skorzeny was the chief of special operations for Hitler. You know, he, was, he fled the Nuremberg trial and found refuge in Spain. There were allegations that he was commanding the SS battalion in Kristallnacht. So the chief of the Mossad replied, you know, if you if you want, you can go and try to recruit this Otto. But from, I can tell you that when you succeed, I'll have hair growing in my palm. But through chain of people, Achituv met with Skorzeny in Spain, and the unbelievable thing happened. <clears throat> Avraham Achituv, a German born, who, who lost all of his family in the Holocaust, recruited Otto Skorzeny who was um, characterized by British intelligence as the most dangerous person in Europe during the war. Hmm. And he did that not because he pretended to be someone else. He's told him that he's from the Mossad. And Skonseni agreed because Achituv could offer him something that nobody else could, life without fear. It was two years after Eichmann was abducted and executed, and he got a letter of immunity from the Israeli prime minister, a new Austrian passport, a lot of money, and he was able to solve the problem for Israeli intelligence. He was the most valuable human asset in the, all of the 1960s for the Mossad. Unbelievable. Mr. Hanning, uh, the story you just heard, it was obviously long before you've been uh, within, uh, <laughs> within office, uh, but... Uh, um, 
was it a topic uh, within BND, um, Mossad operating on on uh, German soil, and which would, would have been the points of contact? Would have been uh, the Mossad office in in Bonn, um, Ronen just talked about. I think in this case, I, I assume not, <laughs> but I don't know, of course. I think uh, Mossad has operated by his, uh, its own capacities in this case. I, I guess, I don't know, but it's my guess. <laughs> yeah. Your book spans over decades and missions and special operations over decades. Uh, scientists, again, have been targeted, obviously, uh, not only German scientists, but Iranian scientists. Uh, um, long after that. Um, we have briefly uh, touched about the line of command, the prime minister, in the case of Krug, we've just heard it was not the prime minister, so there has been an opportunity, obviously, for Issa Harel, the Mossad chief back then, to decide on him, himself. But the prime minister is the only one to, to, to authorize those negative treatments, I think uh, uh, you call them in, in the book. It's a, it's, a, it's a phrase, right? Yeah to give somebody a negative treatment, a euphemism for killing. a killing. Yeah. Um, is there or has there been over all these decades uh, a discussion within Israel about the moral justification for those extra legal killings? Um. For many years, the Mossad has been doing that without any you know, claim of re responsibility, of course. And there were even assassinations the Mossad didn't do and were attributed to the Mossad, and the Mossad never denied them because the, the myth, the legend, even being efficient and ruthless, is part of what the Mossad is, is uh, very happy with. So the Mossad didn't bother to approve or to deny anything. Um, But when Israel turned to an overt uh, killing, uh, targeted killing, that happened during the, 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 the era called the Second Intifada, from 2001 until 2004, when Palestinian jihadist terrorist organization launched a horrific wave of suicide bombing into Israel. They, of course, it was pointless to deny Israeli involvement, and that had become an overt policy. And that also created a discussion. The discussion was, not, was never about the effectiveness or the legitimacy of killing the target. Meaning, I think that there's a consensus, true or not, but there's a consensus in Israel that these people are a legitimate target and that Israel should kill them. The discussion was about the collateral damage. Because once Israel was attacked, The finger on the trigger was much lighter. Israel was using drones and airplanes and helicopters, and these, by nature, create more damage than just a sniper rifle. So in many, many cases, civilians who were in the wrong place in the wrong time got hit, and that created wave of protest to the extent that pilots and commando reserves signed a special petitions that they will never, they will not, no longer take part in these operations. This, you know, this was, from the point of view of Ariel Sharon, who was Israeli prime minister at that time, this was a crisis. He said, no, these people who signed that letter, these are not the, he said, the bitniks with the earring and the green curl in the hair. Meaning these are not people, uh, they, they are central to us, these are heroes. A pilot by the name of Iftach Spekto, who has the, the Guinness record with taking out airplanes during, uh, during air battle, signed that petition. So there was a, there was a crisis in confidence that led um, the IDF and other intelligence branches to, to take precautions, by far more severe precautions, to try and prevent the, 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 the hurt of, um, uh, uh, by standards and collateral damage. Well, of course, uh, the, the moral discussion is an important one. Uh, another one uh, is, of course, how efficient, if one can use the word, has this strategy been? In, in your perspective from the outside, uh, this uh, strategy of uh, targeted killing over so many decades, has it helped Israeli policy? Has it helped Israel as a country? 
Uh, it's a difficult uh, discussion. I think, yes, you can gain time to a certain extent. If you are killing the leadership of uh, Hezbollah, the military leadership, Mugnye, then of course you, this is weakening an organization like Hezbollah. Or looking to the situation in, in the Intifada, yes, if you try to kill the leaders, the military masterminder in the background, then you gain time. But in the end of the day, you can't solve the problems by targeted killings. I'm pretty convinced. We have this problem in Palestine, we have this problem with Lebanon, and you have to find a solution, a proper solution for both sides, for the Palestinians and for Israel. If not, I think you can make so many targeted killings as you want. Uh, the conflict will, will be preserved could not be solved by targeted killings. And therefore, I think, yes, in the end of the day, you have to find a political solution. Very difficult, I know. But you can't solve all these problems uh, by means of intelligence or special operations or by targeted uh, killings. That's my opinion. You have talked to many people who were in charge. Uh, have you felt regret? Have people uh, 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 told you, former head of Mossad, uh, uh, even you talked to uh, former members of kill teams, of assassination teams, did they, how did they live with what they've done? And did they mention that they would have regrets or that perhaps a certain killing was a strategic mistake because you mentioned uh, Navrallah. Um, perhaps things got worse with the new young guy, the ambitious guy. Well, I think that the, 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 there's a consensus in Israel that the policy works, that the doctrine works, that this is a, an essential modus operandi as a prime tool for Israeli defense establishment. There are occasional regrets. First, of course, on the collateral damage, but also on, um, especially on leaders. We mentioned Abbas Musawi in, in Hezbollah. I can mention another point, another case. Um, in November of 1987, the first intifada, a popular uprising of masses of demonstrators with stones and Molotov cocktails started and hit Israel in the occupied territories. Now, Israeli intelligence, who was very, very good with targeting or with, with identifying Palestinian terrorists, saw the, saw the trees but didn't see the wood, meaning they understand who are the terrorists, but they didn't see the popular uprising, the frustration from lack of independence, lack of work, from poverty, from, from the, the economic crisis in the occupied territories. They, they missed all that. And then when it started, everybody were in shock. And Israel didn't know how to confront it. They were few soldiers, not trained to be policemen, facing masses of people. And Israel, in the international media, turned out to be Goliath, and the Palestinians were David. Um, and Israel thought, well, how do we solve it? And they turned out to the weapon that they knew, which is targeted killing. There was a guy, the deputy of Yasser Arafat, Abu Jihad, Khalil al-Wazir, who boasted in an interview with Radio Monte Carlo that he gave the order to start the Intifada, to start the uprising. Now, he was lying. He didn't give order. He didn't know. He, he, he missed that, that, that um, development like Israeli missed it. He just jumped on the wagon when it already was in, in the move. But the Israelis accepted the, the false claim of fame. They said, well, okay, if he gave the order, then if we kill him, then maybe that would stop the Intifada. So, now that guy, there was no doubt, he was involved in the killing of many, many Israelis. He was, you know, the, the, the military and the operational command of the, the PLO. So in terms of, uh, did he deserve to die? Like, he, the, he, he was, he, his hand was soaked with blood of many, many Israelis and Jews. But was that effective? Israelis were hoping that they are going to kill him, and then the Intifada would stop. It, it, re, it, it, uh, it reached the, uh, the opposite, because once he was not there, the uh, popular uh, local 
committees of the Intifada got stronger, and the Intifada got stronger. Hmm. Um, by the way, one of the stories I heard that when they, he was living in Tunis, so this was a huge operation with the participation of actually thousands of people to move an armada fleet to, secretly close to the coast of Tunis, having very good intelligence on each one of the windows of the house. They even built the house, look as if that, like his house, and they rehearsed that. And got them very late at night, and they intercepted the phone line of his house. And just two months before, this, this took like half a year. They killed him in, in April 1988. And one of the intercept calls, I, which I read the transcript, was that his son, the son of Abu Jihad, <coughs> Jihad for that sake, called him from a university in the United States where he learned economics and said, Father, I have decided I'm going to quit school and I'm going to join the armed struggle with you. I'm coming to Tunis to help. And the father, as the Israelis overheard when the intercept said, no way, you are staying there because when we build the independent Palestinian state, we will need people like you, not like me. We need specialists with, with finance. And people, the Israelis who were listening, were very much impressed with his charisma and his role as the leader of the Palestinian people, but also his role as a, as a family man. That didn't help. They went and they killed him. And there are regrets. People who participated in some part, the, that part of the other of the, of the operation said, we wish he was here now with us. He could have been making a, a, a beneficial role for the peace process if we, we wouldn't kill him. Just closing the circle, many, many years after, together, I'm sorry for mentioning another Stiftung, together with the Bertelsmann Stiftung, we went to the territories with a group of German parliamentarians. And they presented us, the Palestinians presented with few people. One of them had excellent English, very eloquent, and he explained to us about the Palestinian economy, he was the head of the Palestinian National Monetary Fund. And suddenly, I realized that that is the son from the recording. This is Jihad. This is the guy who didn't go back to join his father because he refused to accept him to the armed struggle. And now he's running the Palestinian National Monetary Fund. He's fulfilling his father's dream. So, you know, I came to him afterwards and I told him, that I have read the transcript for that, that phone conversation. And he started crying. And if there's some sort of, you know, this is the story full of tragedies, but if there's some sort of optimistic ending, at least for that episode, that he is now building the independent Palestinian state. Hmm. You talked about people involved having regrets, but you've visited some, some, some others who, frankly, are very proud of their work, still are. So you visited... Uh, senior citizen uh, nowadays who was a, a, a builder of explosive devices for the military intelligence. Uh, he actually, I think, built letter bombs that went to the German scientists and injured secretaries and uh, killed, frankly, I think, five Egyptians. So tell us about uh, uh, this visit and his perspective on his past. Yeah, well, I have to, to have a word of... of um a sort of introduction. We Israelis, we sometimes tend to be a little blunt, uh, not very or direct, and not always um, full of uh, politically correctness. Um, and so this is sort of a black humor that uh, some of these operatives are, are using. We were interviewing him. His name is Nathan Rothberg. And he was the special... Um, explosive guy for, for assassination in, in the military intelligence, and he was the one who assembled the letter bombs that were sent to the German scientists. And we were interviewing him for an N a ARD NDR documentary about the German scientist affair. And I was translating to my German colleagues what he was saying in Hebrew. And he said, Ronan, do you know what is the main... Um, phenomenon, the main characteristic that a person like me needs. I said, of course, you love explosives. You love explosives more than you love your wife. <laughs> he said, well, yeah, but more than that. I said, yeah, I don't know. He said, people like me need to know how to forgive. 
He said, forgive? Like, forgive who? Even terrorists? He said, yes, it's not, a, it's not personal. I said, even mega terrorists? Uh, Osama bin Laden said, well, Osama bin Laden is really a mega terrorist. We do not have the authority to forgive him. Only God has the, the, the authority. My job, Nathan's job, was to arrange the meeting. With God, with God. Yeah. With God. Okay. And in my laboratory, he said, I opened the bureau for arranging meetings with God. Now, when I translate this to English, I hear my German colleagues start breathing heavily because they think, how can I include this phrase in a documentary airing in Germany? Because this is, you know, I, this is not a language usually spoken here. And then Nathan says, well, Ronan, ask me how many meetings did I arrange? And I said, Nathan, I got it. Meaning, I got the point because I didn't want to continue. He said, no, no, ask me, please. And then translate. I said, okay, Nathan, how many meetings did you arrange? And he answered, well above 40. And I didn't want to translate it. But he said, Ronan, why don't you translate it to your colleagues? So I ended up uh, meeting. But I just want to add in a more serious tone, the fact that he, that he sort of bragged with that was not because he is the murderer. He wanted people to know that he took part in what he sees and many, many, many other people he sees as the necessary measures that had to be taken to, de to deserve, to, to protect Israeli citizens and Israeli state. Uh, and these people, and this is the main reason why they are talking, because they were involved in these measures that, that according to their perception, had, Israel had no other choice but to do that, rise and kill first. <coughs> One very interesting thing, reading your book, um, and I hope many of you will do that, um, you'll see many familiar names within those um, special operations teams, leading them. Uh, you'll see, you, ha you have the names of uh, Yitzhak Shamir, you have uh, Netanyahu, um, uh, you have many other very, Ehud Barak, uh, many other very familiar names who came to rise within Israeli politics. Uh, What does that do to a politician, Mr. Hanning, if they serve in those special operations team within Intel? You yourself, you've been head of BND, but you've been uh, within the uh, Secretary of uh, Interior, the Federal Secretary of uh, Interior. And uh, did, would you sometimes, uh, as a head of an Intel agency, would have liked politicians who deal with Intel agency having served or worked in that sphere? For me, it's not... Uh... You, I can't understand this because, again, Israel is in a special situation. We don't have politicians like uh, Sharon or, or others. Uh, for good or for bad, I think for good. <laughs> But we are in a comfortable situation. We are not threatened. We have not uh, Palestinians on our soil. We have uh, no threats from our neighborhood. Therefore, I'm a little bit cautious to compare yet uh, political leadership in Israel with the political leadership uh, in Germany. But I think, yes, it has played a certain role in Israeli politics, uh, because security, uh, security of the country, uh, is Israel, is a very important topic. And therefore, uh, the electorate in uh, Israel has made these choices. They have chosen uh, Uh, Netanyahu against Perez uh, and uh, Sharon uh, instead of all the problems, what he has had before, you have mentioned this in your book. Uh, and uh, the Israelis, until today, they are looking to their security. They feel threatened now more by the Iranians, by Hezbollah, uh, by terrorism, and therefore plays security such a very important role in uh, Israel and I was in Munich during this uh, security conference and I followed the speech of Mr. Netanyahu and uh, it was very impressive when he took this piece of the Iranian drone <laughs> and uh, I was a little bit astonished that during his speech he never mentioned Palestine. He never mentioned Palestinians. It was for me a little bit, uh, yes, astonishing uh, in the discussion afterwards, yes. But uh, it shows a little bit the problem, what I see in Israel, and sometimes I remember in this famous, uh, I'll say it in German, 
der Satz von Talleyrand, man kann mit Schwertern trefflich kämpfen, aber schlecht auf ihnen sitzen. In, in English, you can fight with swords, but uh, using them as a chair, sometimes difficult. And uh, I think that is a little bit the problem of Israel. Uh, yes, you are very mighty, you can suppress terrorism, but in the end of the day, it's very difficult to overcome all these problems only by using force, targeted killings, military means, and whatever you want. In the long run, I think, again, it is, would be in the best interest of Israel, from my point of view, to try to find a political solution, a two-state solution. I see that Netanyahu does not want this two-state solution, and I'm pessimistic that under the present leadership it is not achievable. Uh, but nevertheless, you have mentioned that the son of uh, Abu Jihad uh, had a dream of independent Palestine, but this dream is not fulfilled, of course. Now we have this Palestinian authority, but of course Israel is controlling the whole West Bank. Yeah. And there are a lot of people in Israel who want this Eretz Israel, we have the settlement problem and so on. Again, in the end of the day, I think it would be the best interest, I can only repeat it, that there could be more, let me say, Yes, more efforts. You need more efforts to find really a, a peaceful solution in, in, the, in the region. And if you are on the Golan Heights, and I've been several times there, and then you see on the one side Damascus, you see Haifa, you see the Mount Hermon, and you see this small piece of country, it's very, very small. And it could be so wealthy, it could be so rich, if these problems could be solved there. It is really, from my point of view, a nightmare. But again, I'm not very optimistic that we could reach solutions in the short run. But in the long run, I think politicians should undertake more efforts to find really a peaceful solution. You want to react I, can, to I can only sign off to everything you said and agree with everything. Uh, the only maybe news that I can bring, or is, uh, I would say an assessment based on fact, is that we will see a change of leadership in Israel very soon. Netanyahu is done. He's over. His career is, has come to its end. Who will replace him? I don't know. But the criminal accusations against him, those who were published and those who yet to be published, are so severe that um, just three months ago I have made a bet on... Um, a dinner with a Porsche restaurant in Tel Aviv, and the restaurants in Tel Aviv are very, very expensive. <laughs> but good. Uh, that Netanyahu is going to be out in a year. Now three months has passed, and I am shortening this to, to, to six months. So I think that in half a year, in six months, he will be out of his office, and we will either be facing a new coalition or elections. But he's done. And then there's also hope for a new leadership, that would bring a new um, mindset that would say we should, we, we're not just advocating force and we do not only rely on our force, but we also turn to statementship and diplomacy. What do you think? Do you think that the strategy of target killing will always be a piece of, uh, you know, the methods and instruments uh, Israel will use, or you think uh, that there might come a day, perhaps under other leadership, uh, uh, that has second thoughts and will end this strategy? I don't see this this day coming. On the contrary, let's see. Look at what happened in the United States. You know, President Ford has issued an order to stop assassination in 1976 following some uh, serious <laughs> investigations into the CIA illegal conduct. Then for like two decades, the Americans had done nothing in that sense. And after 9-11, the American leadership and intelligence community came to the conclusion that they need to reinstall assassination because They cannot confront current um, challenges, which is mainly terrorism, without targeted killing. Now, they, they call it in a different name. They call it targeted killing and not assassination. But it's just euphemism. It's the same thing. And it has been coming in the U.S. more and more extensive. So President Obama has ordered triple five number of assassination than President Bush. This is a left-wing liberal president 
that advocates you know, human rights, democracy, etc. And I, I'm not being cynical. I'm, I, I, I do think he believes in that. But he thought that this is the best way to confront the national security challenges of the United States. I've asked Michael Chertoff, who was the first uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Homeland Security, what does he think about uh, targeted killings? And he said, I think that they are much better than non-targeted killings. <laughs> and in that sense, this reflects a mindset that advocates the use of them. Israel believes that, this, that it works, and I think that now with present technology, which enables to do that more frequently in a much wider range, geographic, ge geographical range, and with better accuracy, this will become a, 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 even a more central pillar of Israeli defense doctrine. I think that was a, a good word for perhaps opening uh, uh, the discussion uh, for you in the audience. And perhaps uh, if you have a question, um, it would be great if you could perhaps uh, just identify yourself and tell us uh, uh, whom you direct the question to, if uh, to Mr. Hanning or to Mr. Bergman. Uh, and you can pose the question either in German uh, or in English as you like because we have this luxury, thanks to cover, of simultaneous translation. So I already see two hands. Perhaps we start with the lady in front here. And you've got a microphone. Hello, thank you for uh, your uh, good discussion here. I want to ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Beckman, uh, um, what is your standing in Israel? Uh, are you loved by the people, or uh, <laughs> are you very, uh, don't know how to say it, but you can understand me? Um, well, I hope that I'm being loved by my friends and family. <laughs> um, as per the rest, uh, look, it's not the most popular profession in Israel to be a journalist, especially an investigative journalist, especially an investigative journalist who writes about security. There is nothing more holy uh, than security. The last cows that were not slaughtered yet in the public domain are the Mossad and the rest of the Israeli intelligence community. And once you are seen as someone who snoops in and digs in and, and, and of course, brings up not just the uh, good operations, but also the mishaps and the screw-ups and the, and, the, and, the, and the problems and the moral debates, etc., then people see you sometimes as, um, um, I don't know, as, as, as someone who, who doesn't need to uh, work, that doesn't need to be done, a dirty laundry that should not be washed in the public sphere, uh, some, to the extent of being enemy, enemy of, the, of the state an enemy of the public. Um, but, you know, I have, the only way I know how to do this work is doing it and trying to put away and not think about these considerations because otherwise you just start to think how they are going to attack you on the social media tomorrow, then you would end up doing nothing. So, again, the only way I do is just do my work and trying to get the facts right. But, by the way, without having a political agenda. Someone asked me yesterday in Berlin in another uh, Kurdish Stiftung forum, what's my political, what were my political goals when I wrote the book? I have no political goals. I have my political views, but they are not in the book. You cannot understand where do I stand. You, I wanted to tell a story and I wanted to amplify the fact of how profound was the Israeli intelligence impact on history. And I think that by doing that, maybe I'm helping the people of, of Israel understand how important this, our work, the, the, the journalist is, especially when the oversight and scrutiny over the executive branch, and especially on the intelligence, uh, the, the, the institutional scrutiny, is very weak. There's no real oversight effective oversight over the intelligence community. And, it's, and, and when this is the situation, we journalists have something, no, nothing less than holy obligation to fill in and do what the institution is not doing. 
As I've already uh, discussed, you are not qualified for a political position in Israel because you have not been a member of the intelligence community yeah. and <laughs> not run uh, special operations. <laughs> but we should mention one thing. There is such a thing as a military censorship in, in, in Israel, and um, you had to produce, as any of your reporting you do for the newspaper you work for, you had to produce uh, your, the, the results of your investigation to the military censorship, right? And there is a blurb on your book. Uh, uh, what does it say, the blurb from military censorship? When, when, we, when we gave censorship the, uh, the, the manuscript back in 2014, uh, the first manuscript, they said that this is the most uh, revealing and uh, um, uh, I would say detailed book ever written on Israeli intelligence. Hmm. So, interesting. We have another question uh, here in the first row, the gentleman. Yes. Um, ich würde mich dafür interessieren, ob es äh, Erwägungen gibt, wenn solche Operationen vorbereitet werden, äh, Leute zu entführen und vor Gericht zu stellen. Oder ist das eine naive Frage? Also sagt man, gut, wenn wir ihn entführen können oder verhaften können und vor Gericht stellen, dann gut. Und wenn es nicht geht, dann halt eben negatives Treatment. Do you want to answer the Eichmann case? I think is a one example. Ja, ja, but that was a special case as far as I said. But Roland, you should answer. <laughs> You have understood the, the question. The, yes, I understand. The question is, uh, was in regard of the, the alternative, not to kill a person, but to bring him to a due process in court with the judge and the prosecutor and a, and a, and a, uh, and a lawyer. Um, what I described, the Krug case was an, was a, was an exception, but in, because he was first abducted and interrogated and then executed. But in most cases, this is not. This is just killing individuals outside the territory of Israel. In fact, one of the, once Israel made the transition from secret assassination to overt assassination, doing them very, very extensively during the Second Intifada, 2001, the IDF wrote a secret protocol, a legal protocol, for the execution of targeted killing. And one of the measurements, one of the criteria of that protocol, the first one was, it was it's only up to, to the prime minister to authorize. The second was proportionality, that the damage would not be more than the benefit. And the third one, that there is no ability to arrest that person. So if someone, it's a, they, 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 they didn't kill people inside of Israel and these people were brought to trial. But when it was out of Israel, out of Israeli reach, then the alternative was either to leave that person and he might continue with his wrong, his bad doings and bad deeds, or to kill him. But there are, of course, other political uh, considerations that were, that, that were taken. One of the things I'm frequently asked is, was this about revenge? <coughs> Now, the, the element of revenge is there. There's a quote in the book of a Mossad case officer who said, everyone who killed a Jew or an Israeli should know that until the end of his life, we will hunt him down. Sometimes we will, you know, we drop it for some time because of operational reason or political reason, but he will be in our books and we will hunt him down until the end of his life. Um, but most of the operations, unlike the image, with with directed at, as people who were seen as a, as a threat at present time. This is, by the way, the reason why Mossad almost never hunted Nazis. <coughs> now, the legend as if the Mossad that was be, uh, evolving after what happened to Eichmann, the legend as if the Mossad was hunting Nazis is just a legend, it's false. The Mossad left this issue aside on a very low priority, if at all, because as one of the Mossad chiefs told me once, I prefer to deal with current threats to national security than follow ghosts of the past that did not pose any current danger. We have two questions in the same row. Third Back row here. Quite a lot. Guten 
Okay. Ich habe eine Frage, das ist eine juristische Frage. Haben Sie? Das ist eine juristische Frage, die ich Ihnen stelle. Und zwar, Sie sagen, dass wir Terroristen töten, wenn sie aus, außerhalb Israel sind, meinetwegen in England oder in Deutschland oder in Amerika oder wie auch immer. Nehmen Sie keine Rücksicht auf Gastland, dass Sie diese, das Problem austragen in andere Länder. Juristisch gesehen hat das Problem, das Gas, Gastland hat ein Problem dann. Uh, I missed the, the first part, so if you can summarize the question, please. So uh, Israel seems to be externalizing uh, uh, the killings, uh, doing killings in, in other countries, not on Israeli soil. So do they, do that, does that not pose a problem to the countries where the killings happen? And uh, how have the reactions been from those countries? I think the France, France is a good example. Right? Yeah. France and, and, and of course many others. Mm. Um, Have you seen the movie Munich by Steven Spielberg? Many of you, I think, so. This movie is claiming to portray the Mossad work after the killing of the Israeli athletes in, in Munich in 1972. But in fact, this is 100% false. What is described there never happened. Uh, and the reality is different. And maybe I think I'll address the question while explaining what happened after, after Munich. Before, and this is why Munich and what happened in Munich is important to understand Israeli defense and counterterrorism doctrine. Before Munich, people of Mossad came to the Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir and said, listen, we are supplying the European intelligence services with warnings, with alerts, with information about terrorist, Palestinian terrorists on their ground, in their territories, and they do nothing because they want to maintain a neutrality. Why don't we go and we bomb that embassy of, of the PLO in Rome or that representative in, in, um, in uh, uh, whatever, London? Frankfurt. Fra oh, Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Yeah, oh, yeah, and we, we bomb them and we make a very clear signal. And Golda Meir did not allow them. They said, these are friendly countries, which their intelligence services are conducting very friendly discourse with us. They will never let us kill people on the ground if we ask for permission. If we do it without permission, they are going to be furious because they are a sovereign state. She said, These, this, is not, this is not simple. This is not our country. And then happened Munich. And what happened in Munich changed all that. Not because Palestinians killed some Israeli athletes, meaning, it's, 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 of course, it's awful. But Palestinians killed Israelis before. What, what changed that was that the Mossad chief at that time, Tzvika Zamir, came back from Munich and described to the cabinet the incompetency of the German security forces in rescuing the athletes. And Golda Meir was, was deeply affected from that description. The Israeli public took it in the, the most grave mood possible. It was the, the, the New Year's Eve of the new Israeli year, Jewish year. And everybody was so sad. And Golda Meir was even thinking that she's going to lose the elections because of looking incompetence. And she changed the orders. From, so from that point on, she said, if the European services are not taking care of terrorists, we will do it ourselves and we will kill Palestinian terrorists on European territory. And that is what happened in Munich. The Mossad didn't kill the people who were behind Munich. They were killing PLO operatives. But they did it in Western Europe. Did that answer your question? The, <laughs> no. Okay, so, look, I, the, of course, the killing on a sovereign state creates a problem for the sovereign state. The problem or the question is whether this sovereign state um, used any mean possible to make sure that there are no, no terrorists on its territory. And I think that at least at that time, the answer was no. It changed now, of course. Now we're talking about the different Europe. And I don't, th I don't think that we heard that the Mossad has assassinated anyone in Europe recently. But It's not in your book? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> But maybe two additional, additional remarks. The Palestinians in Munich, as far as I know, they came from outside. They have not been posted inside Germany. 
I don't want to excuse the problems. Uh, the other point was that the German uh, uh, intelligence services never got special information about uh, this terrorist threat, uh, about this uh, Olympic uh, team. And uh, I think that was maybe an intelligence failure, uh, but of course, and the reaction in Germany was uh, the foundation of GSG9, GSG9, I think. And now we are far better prepared than that. We have learned our lessons, yes. <laughs> And we have one question here, and several in the back. I've, I've seen you too, but uh, yeah. Good evening. I'm Alexander Scram from the Junge DGAP. Um, and I've got a question for, uh, for Mr. Henning. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, targeted killing or negative treatment, or whatever we want to call it, um, is forbidden for the BND uh, by German law. Um, but I believe the cooperation between the BND and the Mossad is very close regarding information exchange, etc. Um, so how did the BND deal uh, with situations where you knew or could guess that an information being delivered to the Mossad could lead to a, to a negative treatment? I, would, I was never in the position to uh, uh, have been forced to make such a decision, to be very clear. Of course, we had a change on behalf of terrorism, of uh, preventive measures, uh, um, but we have mentioned all these problems, targeted killings. Uh, we have sometimes some problems, not for me, but for my successors, for example, in Afghanistan. When you know that there are on the other side, on the Taliban side or on the Islamistic side, there are people who are uh, carrying out terrorist attacks against the German soldiers there. And uh, if you provide information to the United States, uh, and uh, they make this kind of targeted killings or the army. Uh, is it allowed, is it not allowed, is a difficult question. Uh, I was never in the position to make this kind of decision, but uh, I think that are very crucial situations even for uh, Germany, not for the BND, but of course for the, the army and for the political decision makers. That's a very valid question. When it comes to Rammstein, uh, uh, for instance, um, what's your position on that? Well, Rammstein is, I think, it's a sovereign base from the United States, and it's their responsibility, from my point of view. Therefore, that's an easy answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are not the supervisor of the United States in Rammstein. Sorry. <laughs> several questions from the back. Yes. Yes, I'm Michael Jacoby, an entrepreneur from Kiel, and I would like to know about the credible, um, how credible you think Viktor Ostrovsky might be, because he was talking about Uwe Barschel, which is a case in Kiel, and also about Stoffberg and how deep um, the Mossad is involved in the nuclear program in South Africa. Yeah. Well, to address all this, we need at least two days. Uh, but I'll do this briefly uh, in explaining who Viktor Ostrovsky is. Viktor, Viktor Ostrovsky was a, a Mossad cadet who uh, spent very little time in the Mossad and was fired. He went back to Canada, with, where he was uh, born, um, to, of course, a Jewish family. Uh, he went back and then he published in 1989 a book about the Mossad called By Way of Deception, which had a grain of truthful information which he knew from his time in the Mossad. Well, a lot of stories that he invented because at the end of the day, you need to publish a book. You need to have some text. Uh, and everyone who knew something about the Mossad immediately saw that some of the names and description could not happen or he's positioning people in the wrong places. Um, that could have gone e very easily and nobody would notice him, but the Mossad got wind of the fact that he's going to publish the book. They burgled the, they burgled the, uh, the, um, the publishing house. They stole the manuscript. They brought it back home. They were horrified because this was the first time ever that someone from the Mossad wrote a book. He knew very little, but it was enough to make them very much concerned. They thought what to do. There was one idea to kill him. But then the Israeli prime minister at that time, uh, Itzhak Shamir, said, we do not kill Jews. And the other idea was to leave him alone, you know, let him, but Mossad couldn't, you know, help do something. So they appealed to, this, to the courts in Canada and in the United States 
to ban the book on the basis of the secrecy agreement that he signed when he joined the Mossad. Now you come to a court in the United States and you say, ban a book. This is like the worst thing that you can do. And it took like two minutes until they threw out the, the lawyers from the Mossad. And what they did was just to give a stamp of authenticity to the book of Viktor Ostrovsky. Here is the book that the Mossad doesn't want you to read. It became a bestseller in a fragment of a second. And he bought a new house, just from the a very good house, in, in, in Montreal, thanks to the money he earned from, from that stupid mistake the Mossad has done. To the question of the authenticity of the stories that you mentioned, I think that much of it is a fabrication or um, stories that were attributed to the Mossad and Ostrovsky inhaled them into the book and made them credible. Uh, the Mossad, again, the Mossad never denies or approves anything. And therefore, throughout time, much of uh, political assassination of Olaf Palma and, and others were attributed to Mossad. The, the one who made this into, again, a bestseller was a, a, writer by the name, a British writer by the name of Gordon Thomas, who wrote a book called Gideon Spies. One of the main stories of that book was that Monica Lewinsky was a Mossad operation. <laughs> the, Congratulations. The Mossad, uh, this is a, Congratulations. It's a serious, I'm so, yeah. <laughs> the, okay. uh, he said that the Mossad was convinced that, the, that, the, um, that, that Bill Clinton is not pro-Israeli enough. So they had the hand in the whole Monica Lewinsky case in order to impeach Bill Clinton. Now, of course, it's a ludicrous story. And I think that there were people in the Mossad, they told me, I wish, we wish that we had this kind of imagination and ability. The Mossad Matahari, yes. Yeah, okay. Mossad Matahari. <laughs> I mean, we're laughing now, of course, about uh, Ostrovsky and Monica Lewinsky. How can you be sure to be right with what you've heard from the former heads of Mossad? We know that, you know, Intel services are masters of deception. It's within the... the uh, their uh, instruments and methods, uh, active measures. Um, so why can you be sure to be on the right side? Yeah. Well, I, I, I cannot be sure. As you said, politicians and intelligence officers are the masters of disinformation, manipulation, and probably many of them try to manipulate me. They wanted to have history written in the way they want it to be written, and their footprint set upright according to them. I confronted that with, I think, three active measures. One is my experience. I have been a journalist for many, many years, and I think that I have some judgment to see if someone is telling you the truth or not. The second is by interviewing many, many, many people. As you said, 1,000 people. It's very, very hard to coordinate a story, to coordinate a lie between so many people that do not know who I'm going to approach next. And third is to, to have as many documents as possible. Now, there are many, many cases in the book which are following some sort of a Rashomon effect, that people are telling a different story about the same event. You know, the chief of, uh, of Mossad, um, Tamir Pardo, former chief, um, once told me, he said, listen, I, got, I had people coming to brief me about something they did two days earlier than that in an operation, and they were telling different stories because everyone has, not because they were lying, but everyone has a subjective point of view. How can you judge people who come to you 30 years after and tell you stories? So you just, you, sometimes you cannot judge. And I give a very full description of the different narratives, and I said that there is a discrepancy here. Okay. We have <laughs> some in the back, and then we come to you. Good evening. Um, I'm a medieval historian and wonderfully innocent about all things concerning intelligence services. So I would like to ask both of you, one specific to Israel and one general, um, how do you rein in such an intelligence service if there is one single person who can authorize a killing, an assassination? How do you stop such a service from going rampant, especially in these days where a terrorist can be a great many things. Thank you. <laughs> I was never in the position. <laughs> But I can assure you 
uh, in Germany, uh, the BND and all the other uh, intelligence services are well controlled, and uh, it would never happen, I can tell you. Therefore, I think these fears are not really uh, reasonable. And I think, but you have to answer, uh, I think uh, even Mossad is strictly controlled in, the, in this sense, and uh, there have not been uh, killings or major operations without the prior consent of the political leadership in Israel, as far as I see it. Well, this is correct. The, 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 the instances, I mentioned one about Krug, but, but, uh, but the instances where the intelligence community went rogue are extremely rare. Israel is a very small country. Everybody knows everybody. And for someone to take action without the authority, this would be discovered in, in no time. Um, the, the difficulty is not going to do something without authority. The, 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 the risk is that the intelligence community would identify a target that would be the one that they can kill and rather the one they should kill or the, 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 a, a better target in that sense. So they will come to the prime, the prime minister who, you know, have little time. He has other problems to deal with, especially this prime minister. And he has like an hour every, or two hours every, every week to, deal, to, to meet with Mossad chief. And the Mossad chief will say, well, this guy is our prime target. And the prime minister will have very little time to understand whether this is the guy that they were able to collect information about. So he became a prime target. Or indeed, <clears throat> he needs to be killed because he is the prime target. So there are risks here, but it's not just, you know, going without authority and kill whatever they want. Yeah, good evening. Ich gebe das. Ähm, ja, ich denke, unsere Europäische Union ist verpflichtet, also die Demokratie, die Menschenrechte und den Frieden in Israel zu verteidigen. Dennoch als Politikerin, als Sozialliberal, also bin ich äh, gegen die Todesstrafe. Also in Europa ist die Todesstrafe also abgeschafft. Ich denke, man kann die Demokratie Israel, die Demokratie allgemein ohne den Einsatz von Geheimdienst auch verteidigen. Deswegen also würde ich nicht auf diese Methode eingehen. Ich hätte eine Anfrage an Herr Anning. Herr Anning, wir wissen, dass der BND also rechtsradikale Angestellte beschäftigt, dass der BND sozusagen also von bestimmten Neonazis unterwandert wird. Meine erste Frage ist, was haben Sie zu der Zeit, wo Sie diese Stelle haben, auch gegen die Unterwanderung von Neonazi-Angestellten auch unternommen? Und, <lacht> ja, das ist eine gute Frage. Ähm, Herr Bergmann, also ähm, ich verstehe in einigen Maßen Ihren Standpunkt. Sie, äh, Sie sind ein hervorragender Intellektuell. Ich hätte eine Frage, was haben Sie, also Sie nicht, aber was hat der Mossad mit dem ähm, Gedächtnis der Geschichte Abraham, also du darfst nicht töten, gemacht? Vielen Dank. Ja, ich darf mal auf Deutsch äh, antworten. Also äh, natürlich war bei der Gründung des BND äh, waren Leute beschäftigt, die eine herausragende Position äh, in der NS-Hierarchie bekleidet haben, in der Wehrmacht. Das war in vielen deutschen Institutionen so, das war bei der Bundeswehr so, dass ehemalige Wehrmachtgeneräle auch die Bundeswehr aufgebaut haben, Herr Heusinger. Herr Gehlen, der erste Direktor des BND, war Chef der Nachrichtenaufklärung Fremde Heere Ost und war natürlich auch in der Wehrmacht tätig. Auf der anderen Seite, in der Zeit damals, äh, mein, wir tun uns da jetzt leicht im Rückblick, äh, wie wollte man das Deutschland, was 1945 in der Lieder lag, wieder aufbauen. Und äh, Adenauer hat seinerzeit die Entscheidung gefällt, dass man auch auf Leute zurückgreifen sollte, die im NS-Regime verstrickt waren, die aber sozusagen aus seiner Sicht geläutert waren. Und ich erinnere mich noch, da gab es eine Pressekonferenz und da wurde er gefragt, wie es denn käme, dass, ich weiß gar nicht, Herr Heusinger, glaube ich, zum Generalinspekteur der Bundeswehr ernannt wurde, und hat er gesagt, ja, nennen Sie mir mal einen General, der da keine Erfahrung hat. Punkt. So war das. Also, kurzum. Das war eine Grundentscheidung, die war 
kann man darüber streiten. Im Ergebnis hat das sicher dazu beigetragen, dass dieses Land äh, Westdeutschland, die Bundesrepublik Deutschland, wieder relativ rasch aufgebaut werden konnte. Und äh, als zu meiner Zeit, um die Frage direkt zu beantworten, äh, war das kein Thema mehr. Das hatte auch schon was mit dem Alter zu tun. Aber es gab auch durchaus Probleme, denn äh, jetzt kommen wir ein bisschen äh, sozusagen in Seitengewässer, aber Herr Gehlen meinte, er müsse ein besonderes Vertrauen entwickeln gegenüber den alten Kameraden aus der Wehrmacht. Und deswegen hat er die auch am Anfang genutzt, um die Org Gehlen aufzubauen. Und dann gab es die große Enttäuschung in Sachen Felfe. Herr Felfe war im Reichssicherheitshauptamt und war einer der größten Verdachtsfälle bzw. der Spionagefälle im Bundesnachrichtendienst. Und danach hat eine umfassende Säuberung stattgefunden. Es war nämlich so, dass Herr Felfe geworben wurde, auch unter Hinweis auf seine Vergangenheit im Reichssicherheitshauptamt. Und äh, das hat dazu beigetragen, dass äh, aus vielen Positionen des damaligen BND ehemalige, wie Sie sagen, Nazis oder belastete Personen entfernt worden sind, weil sich herausgestellt hat, dass sie eben belastbar waren, dass sie auch ein Risiko waren für den Bundesnachrichtendienst. Herr Felfi ist dann ja in die DDR gegangen und äh, wurde Professor für Kriminologie an der humboldt -Uni. Nur so viel dazu. <lacht> Abraham? Ja. Well, um, of course, one can advocate that murder, the killing is forbidden, not just by God, but also by human. This is in Israel, as well as in all the other countries, is the most serious offense in the criminal code. But um, let me answer in a question. And, uh, you know, I, I strongly support the two-state two solution. I think that Israel has need to have a better political um, leadership that would go to a political discourse with the Palestinians, a discourse that would hopefully end with a Palestinian state. But I'm not sure that all Palestinians would adopt this idea. Hamas says that they will fight until the end of times, until Israel is wiped out, that Israel has no uh, right to exist. Hezbollah in Lebanon says the same, that Israel is like a spider web and they will smash it and the Israel has no right to, to exist. Now, It's very nice to advocate the Ten Commandments, but let's say that you have, that you work in the Mossad and you know, or the Shin Bet, and you know that there's, a, there's an operative who sends suicide bombers each day to explode in buses and kindergartens in, in Israel. You cannot get to him because he's out of your reach. You cannot arrest him, you cannot prosecute him. And the only way is either to accept it and you know, having people being killed every day, or to kill him. I don't envy the one who needed to make that by the diabolic decision what to do. And just to say that if talking about effectiveness of, the, of targeted killing, the fact that Israel used targeted killing to counter the, target, the, the suicide bombers in the Second Intifada was the only thing that made them stop. Israel targeted the, 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 the upper layer of commanders of Hamas, not the, two, the suicide bombers themselves, and they stopped. They begged for a ceasefire after three years of targeted killings. Okay, perhaps, I think we have time for perhaps two or three more questions. I know there are two here that actually showed their hands for a long time, and perhaps you there, then we have three. Three more questions, please, here. Uh, Mr. Bergman, you uh, said uh, you felt that uh, Netanyahu was on his way out. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, till now, he has survived all uh, claims of being corrupt. So that's the first question which I have. Uh, why do you think there will be a change? Because till now, apart from Rabin, everybody was a cold warrior from Ben-Gurion to Golda Meir to uh, Sharon to Shamir, everybody wanted to annihilate Palestina, let's say. Now, if you look at the situation right now, 
Who will roll back all those Israeli settlements? Who will change the situation when Trump comes over to uh, proclaim Jerusalem as the uh, capital of Israel? Who will uh, negotiate uh, whatever is left of, of what is supposed to be someday? Is a Palestinian state? Yeah. Well, uh, again, we need a few days to address all the points that you just raised. But uh, let me say this. First, on Netanyahu's political horizon. Um, I said I, I've made one bet of a dinner. I can make another bet with you that he's not going to be Israeli prime minister in a short while. Uh, why? Because, you know, investigation and, and on corruption have their path. And they have come to a point, a point of no return. There are state witnesses who are testifying his, about his profound involvement in corruption. There is no way back. He's going to be prosecuted. And if he does not very fast reach a deal with the attorney general that he's stepping down in return for dropping the charges against him, if it's not already too late for him, then he is going to spend, um, he's going to be likely to be in jail. Yeah, well, that's, I'm not sure that that will help him with the police and the attorney general. Now, about, I don't ex accept your point that everyone except Itzhak Rabin wanted to annihilate the Palestinian state because first there was not a Palestinian state. The question is, of course, on people who supported on, or did not support the two-state solution, which is also a gradual, gradual uh, position. Ariel Sharon, the warmonger, at the end of his life, changed his mind. He evacuated Gaza. Yeah. And he was just about to sign, and you know, regretfully he suffered the stroke and, 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 and stepped down. But he, this is the proof of someone who, at the end of his life, came to the conclusion that force doesn't solve everything. And he, and he was just about, he, if he was there, we would have seen an independent Palestinian state. Yes, thank you, Mr. Beckman. I would like to ask you, uh, do you see a close connection between the activity of Mossad uh, to the value of uh, uh, the country of Israel? Uh, you know, they, uh, they are uh, very successful in, in many science uh, areas and have uh, agriculture, so they are very creative. And is it... Ah, okay. Uh, uh, don't you see that there is a close connection between uh, the defense activity by uh, the Mossad and the values of, of the country, and that they are not killing just for killing, but purely to defend the existence, and the existence which are very creative and innovative uh, in, in many areas, in, in medicine and uh, uh, whatever, even the... Um, uh, uh, cap capacity to uh, uh, fight against uh, uh, terrorism is used in many countries. So do you, don't you see any positive uh, uh, um, aspects uh, uh, or is it a, a purely uh, a negative thing, uh, the, the Mossad activity? Thank you. Well, I think that I've made it clear that I, that I believe that targeted killing have been very effective and um, that this is a crucial and a central part and a pillar of the Israeli defense doctrine. And it worked in many, many cases, while of course no, not losing sight of the moral implication and the legal uh, difficulties. Um, I, of course, I do see a, 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 a direct connection between Israeli prestige as being very successful and a um, very lively country. And uh, being more specific, I would say that the, the fact that the Israeli intelligence has been so advanced in technology, necessity is the mother of all inventions. And many, many of the inventions that later on were extrapolated to the civilian markets by Israeli startups started with necessity to come with some solutions to military and intelligence needs. 
a guy by the name of Gil Shved just won um, the Israeli prize, the highest decoration for an Israeli for innovation. Now, Gil Shved was a young officer in one of the technology divisions of military intelligence. And they had a difficulty. They, wanted, they had two systems on the same computer. One was classified, the other one was not. So they said, let's have two computers on the same one. And they built a perception, a concept, which he called firewall. This was 1989. Then he retired, he finished, and he established Checkpoint, which is the, the biggest company on security. And firewall is something installed in every one of these computers. So it's just one example of how Israeli intelligence gave birth to startup nation. So we have uh, one last question over there, I think. And, uh, but then I promise I have uh, three good news for you, so please stay after <laughs> the last answer. Ich habe eine Frage an Herrn Bergmann. Wie definieren Sie einen Terroristen? Also Israel hat äh, die Palästinenser Gebiete besetzt und äh, baut seit Jahrzehnten Siedlungen, sodass die Palästinenser äh, die Chance auf einen eigenen Staat und auf Selbstbestimmung aus meiner Sicht inzwischen verloren haben. Andererseits wäre es doch so, wenn ein palästinensischer Staat entstünde, dann wären das plötzlich nicht mehr Terroristen, sondern vielleicht Angehörige von Polizeieinheiten oder so. Ist nicht ähm, die Darstellung, wie Sie sie bringen, indem Sie also die, das politische Umfeld, in dem der Mossad agiert, indem er einfach ein Werkzeug ist, um die Siedlungspolitik abzusichern, Insofern einseitig. Well, if I understand the, um, the question correctly, it was, I would say, a political statement about the definition of terrorist and terrorism. Um, do I understand it correctly? Not only a statement, but also a question. Yeah. Um, As I said, I 100% support the need for discourse with the Palestinians that would end with the two-state solution, Palestine and Israel. However, when a person sends another person to explode himself on a bus, I, I have no other way to describe this person other than a terrorist. And many of these people very publicly and overtly say, even if the two-state solution is implemented, that doesn't um, satisfy us. We, they come from a religious point of view, according which all of Israel is waqf, is, is a holy Islamic territory. And the people, the Jews on that land, cannot be governed by the Jewish um, state or Jewish regime, and they are foreigners that should go back to the places that, where they came from. And so, you know, we, we see what is happening in the Arab world. The, the uh, Islamic, the, the Arab Spring in many cases has turned into an Islamic winter. That had nothing to do with Israel and nothing to do with the Palestinian problem and nothing to do with the Mossad, and nothing to do with everything that we have just discussed here. And so I can understand the fear from many Israelis, which unfortunately is am amplified by propaganda of Netanyahu. But at the core of it, there is a justified fear <coughs> that if Israel give the, ter the territory back to the Palestinians, and again, something I strongly support, it would end up with just another jihadist state or jihadist-run regime. And I think that we have to do much more and much more and faster in order to encourage the moderate and the secular elements of the Palestinian society. And this is something that Israel is failing to do in order to make sure that once a 
Palestinian state is established. And I don't think it's too late. I don't accept that. I think that there's no other way but two-state solution. The evacuation of the settlements, it will happen. And it will happen sooner than later because there's no other choice. We must make sure that before this is happening, we do not destroy the civil society of Palestine and make sure that they will prevail the day they are given independence. So we ending here on a hopeful note, which is great. Uh, 10 minutes over time. I promised uh, three additional good news. First being, if you're curious now, on the book is more than 800 pages. There is a table with books outside. Don't intimidate them. It's, it's big letters, <laughs> small pages. <laughs> Many footnotes. <laughs> Secondly, uh, Mr. Bergman has agreed to, to stay a little while and sign on your request, if, you, if you wish him uh, to sign the books. And uh, third, but not uh, last, uh, by courtesy of Körber Stiftung, Körber Stiftung invites you uh, for a small reception um, and a glass of wine. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you Thanks for your interest. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the panel.